Um, welcome to the 1715 Colloquium by ETH Library. My name is Noemi Oman, and I welcome you here on site as well as online in front of the screens um, to our topic, research quality as a, ba as a basis or the, as the basis for research assessment. As usual in the, co in the colloquium, we will first hear a presentation of about 30 minutes. And then in the second half, you will have the opportunity to discuss the topic with our guest. Uh, if you participate online, you can use the chat to ask questions. Our speaker today is Michael Ochsner. He is a senior researcher at FORCE, the Swiss Competence Center for Social St uh, Sciences in Lausanne, as well as at the Center for Reproducible Research at the University of Zurich. His work uh, focuses on frameworks for um, on, on uh, conceptual frameworks for research evaluation, and he pays particular attention to cross-national differences in research policy and research evaluation, and to the identification of research quality. In the following presentation, we will learn more about uh, his research projects on research quality in the social sciences and humanities and to what extent the results are also relevant um, for sciences. Michael Ochsner will show us uh, the complexity of the construct research quality and that it requires a broad uh, set of metrics, methods, and criteria. And now I hand over to you and wish us all an exciting colloquium. Thank you very much and good evening to everyone in the room and also online. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, and I'm very happy to be here at ETH to speak about my uh, research um, that actually started some 14 years ago at ETH. Um, so I, I thought this is a very nice way to round out, round out um, the work I have done and to give an account of uh, what has happened in my research in the last uh, few years. Um, I will fly quite high, so um, I won't go very much into the detail. The idea would be to show the basic uh, conclusion of each and every study um, regarding the meaning of how to evaluate research. And I base myself mainly on the study of the humanities, social sciences and the arts. But in, in the end, um, I think we should reflect upon how this knowledge from those disciplines can inform how research could be evaluated also in other disciplines, in, other, in, in the sciences. So uh, I will start about um, the context. So first of all, evaluation happens in a specific um, context, political context, um, and this is relevant for how we perceive research quality. Then I will talk about what quality could mean and how indicators relate to that concept. Um, then I will show how research eva is evaluated across countries, because that would inform us already a little bit about what research evaluation is. Um, and finally, come to the main part of the uh, presentation of today, um, which is the question, what is research quality? And how can we grip it, how we can we grasp it and, and, and get hold of it. I will then briefly sketch out uh, a concept or a framework or foundations for responsible research evaluation. And finally, we'll try to give some inputs um, 
and considerations how that might be useful also for uh, for the sciences. So currently we're in a situation of change. There is a lot of policy talk about reforming research assessment. Um, it all started with the DORA uh, declaration in 2012 when suddenly policymakers were told that uh, using metrics is maybe problematic. Of course, uh, discussions were there for a long time, but the DORA declaration put it, gave it some traction among policymakers, which started rethinking. Um, also, the Line Manifesto happened more or less at the same time. And 10 years later, we have QARA, which is the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, which is a high stake uh, consortium um, that envisions a change of research assessment in Europe and also globally. So we see that there is a strong discussion about reforming research evaluation and understanding that some use of indicators is inadequate, has um, adverse effects. Um, DORA focuses very much on the journal impact factor and on H-index and basically said we need to eliminate journal level metrics in order to assess uh, individual level uh, research. Quara goes quite further. Um, Quara requires their signatories to base their assessment primarily on qualitative judgment. So we are already quite a step further. Now, what is the situation in science policy and the um, SSH? The SSH have a long tradition of criticizing indicator-based evaluation. This has a lot of reasons, um, one of which is, of course, that the data that is usually used is not adequate for them. But it's going, it has gone even further. It was also about that is not adequate, that research quality cannot be represented in numbers. Um, also, other concepts that are discussed currently very strongly, um, like open access, open data, and open peer review, have a very long tradition in the SSH, which is basically unknown. So, for example, libraries and museums are one way for giving access to the public for copyrighted materials, which is the same idea as open access, but implemented very differently. Um, open data has started basically in economics. Um, an open peer review, we can think of book reviews, the tradition of reading books and writing short articles in journals that review the book. However, there is a hierarchy um, in science where the STEM are seen as real science, they are objective, they're rational, they're going to find truth. While the SSH, they just provide arguments, they are basically critical, and they are creating beliefs. But also, there are very, very different approaches in knowledge production, and also, therefore, in approaching evaluation. Uh, the STEM fields have uh, a tradition of trial and error. We experiment, we improve, we adjust, and we repeat. The SSH, they think and then do. And basically, they think, which is the problem, right? Um, because the doing is what they have been accused, that, which is what is missing, because they criticize, but they don't really propose something valuable. So we need to bring the two things together instead of putting them to opposite um, positions. The trial and error procedure, however, is very, very dangerous when it comes to, social science, uh, to the science system. Because changes that we apply, they might be fatal and very much enduring, so we cannot correct. So we have to think in advance what kind of effects our evaluation procedures will have. Indicators. We have a strong tradition in indicator-based evaluation, 
because it's very easy. However, um, numbers are not always very meaningful, and I think you all know the novel by uh, Douglas Adams, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, that starts with the idea that there is a huge computer, it's the best computer ever, and so the humans ask him what is the ultimate, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe and everything. And the computer calculates for seven million years and it gives the answer and the answer is 42. So we have a number, but the people get upset. What should we do with, the, with, with, with this number? What does it mean? And the point is the question was meaningless. So what should I answer to such a question? So I need to really specify what I want to know. I need to make a connection between uh, the number and what I want to measure. So there's an issue of validity. So quality, performance, societal impact, etc., are concepts that do not necessarily have a clear meaning. We first need to think about what it actually means. Scientometrics, however, and bibliometrics has been very, very data-driven. So we measure what we can measure, we find an indicator, and this makes us the concept of quality. So what we can measure produces what we call quality. However, this is not necessarily valid, because we need first to know what we want to measure. So the question is, what is quality? Because if we evaluate, we distinguish between better and worse, or even between good and bad. However, quality is a very complex construct, and there is no clear definition. We know that. We cannot just ask everyone what is research quality. But it is also very disputed and very emotional. So what can we do in such a situation? <coughs> we take a step back, and I want to show you uh, with the example of music um, how we can approach the concept of quality. So what is good music? So we can use, for example, Spotify, which provides us a lot of indicators, in fact. So I chose a few examples. Some of them you might know, some not. It doesn't really matter. But here is Nirvana, one of my, the, the, the most important groups of my generation. It's in the 1990s. It is very abrasive. It has a, an aesthetic of ugliness. And the five most played songs on Spotify are State Yesterday, 4.3 billion. To the group uh, that is more the generation of my mom, the Beatles from the 60s, so much longer time. Um, they are known for beat and for very exquisite songwriting. Four, four five most played songs, 3.3 billion. So already much less than Nirvana, even though they exist much longer. So they're obviously less good than Nirvana. Mozart. Even much longer, and he is more or less that what we call a genius, right? That, we, that, that almost the defini definition of a genius in music. Five most placed song, 2.7 or 2.8 almost billions. Overestimated, obviously. Miles Davis, a jazz player with a long career, and he has invented loads of different styles of playing jazz, even less, 2.6 billion. But then Toxner, it's not only uh, the same name as me, but they are also very, very known in Switzerland. They sing in Swiss German. Five most placed songs, even though they are really Swiss classics, 28 million, so we are totally in a different scale. And now Ariana Grande exists in 2010s, more or less, focuses on teenies, 6.1. Obviously, best musician around. Obviously, that's, that's, that there is a problem, right? So it's not only me that doesn't agree, but uh, we have some issues here. So maybe we rather look at monthly listeners. It's another indicator that we can maybe correct. So we see Nirvana, 28 million, Beatles, 29. OK, there is already a correction. But Mozart still only 6.8, and so on. 
Ariana Grande far from the others. Albums sold, Nirvana 95, Beatles 600 millions, Mozart 10, Ariana Grande less than six. We can go on and on, we can find different indicators, we will have a similar issue here. But then, shall we rather ask experts what is good music? We could ask our piano teacher, or we could ask the director of important labels, music labels, a radio DJ, we could look at the awards, different awards there are. We also will have some bias here because we will hear what we already know. We will, there will be a lot of mainstream music, we will miss on the avant-garde, and we will have, as we Spotify, original bias, but Intoxna will not win the Grammy. This is obviously the same problem we have in bibliometrics, in research. We have systematic bias of the data, uh, we have language that is a very important indicator of whether you're scoring high or low. We have different regional things. A German political scientist needs to be active in the American discussion, in the international discussion, in the German discussion, and in the European Union discussion. While the American scholar, he has only the American discussion where he needs to be active or she. Topics. In some countries, some topics are discussed in, in, in their national languages, those will not be covered in Web of Science, those will not be um, seen in the data. Same issue with peer review. We know there are several biases. We have gender bias, we have regional bias, we have institutional bias, etc., etc. We have even low interrate reliability. If you ask two different peers, we'll get two different answers, or even three. But would be agreement, a high agreement, be better? Or would we just ask twice the same person? In a way, the same idea, the same school of thought. The problem with peer review is also when we ask the peer reviewers what is high quality, they will answer, well, I'm, there are different standards, etc., but I know it when I see it. That's very well documented. So we have a problem of validity for both approaches. So what can we do? Our response was, we look into what quality actually means. First, find out what we want to measure. And this project started early with Hans-Dieter Daniel at the ETH Zurich and with uh, Sven Hoek. We did a lot of research on quality. I will not now not give a temporal account about this research program I was involved in, but rather try to follow a logical, uh, a logical um, step or procedure. So I will start with giving you account of how research is evaluated in different countries. It's a study we have done in the network, um, European network of research evaluation in the social science and humanities. And we asked several experts how research is evaluated in their country. And what we find is a, is a quite a large diversity. We have two dimensions plotted here. The first one is whether there are metrics applied and whether there is a database of research uh, articles available. And the second dimension we call SSH adaptation, but we could just simply call it discipline adaptation. And what we see is we find different types. So we have countries that have no database and no adaptation. So any discipline will be evaluated exactly the same way, but without a clear database. Switzerland belongs to a group that is called non-metric SSH specific, so we care about disciplines, but we do not really have um, a national database in place. Then there is performance-based funding systems. They link money to uh, evaluation outcomes, um, which uh, use some metrics, but also peer review. But there is also performance-based funding that only looks at indicators. And finally, we have um, a metric evaluation that is based entirely on English um, scholarly outputs. So we see there is a lot of uh, differentiation. 
We then looked rather into how research is really evaluated and we found out that we don't even talk about the same things when we use the term research evaluation. We found eight, seven different types of evaluation procedures that are or are not in place in different countries. It's accreditation. Almost all countries have some form of accreditation. The national evaluation protocols that can be formative or performance-based, excellence initiatives, then national career promotion, project funding, and evaluation by academies of sciences. And what we see is that not a single country looks like the other. If you look to societal impact evaluation, the same picture emerged. We have studied 11 countries and we have found 11 ways of evaluating societal impact. It goes from demonstrating manifest impact that is used, for example, in the UK and in the Netherlands. They differ, however, how, how it influences the funding. We have another country like the Czech Republic, which is called, has a system that is called coffee grinder because there are so many indicators and every single output has some kind of points, so it's very complicated. And then we have countries where it's rather societal impact is, is not so important, it's rather relation to society. So what is relevant for society? That is uh, in Switzerland or in Ireland. So very, very diverse. And this diversity we also find when we look at how societal impact of research is promoted and communicated through learned societies. If you look how they interact with different stakeholders and, and publish, publish um, um, popular books, we see again we have different types. We have Portugal, which is more or less academically oriented. They um, see what is relevant from the point of view of scholars and will communicate mainly to scholars. We have um, Switzerland, that is rather conformity of topic, so it's, it's relation to society. They will, it is relevant how topics are generated. So scholars listen to different stakeholders when they pro propose their projects, but it's not relevant what they do with it. We have information and education, is learned societies who interact with schools, because basically education and higher education is here to inform populations and schools. And finally, we have what we most know when we talk about societal impact, consulting and interactions. So countries where it is important to engage with stakeholders, where they are evaluated by the output, so they need to have contacts with business, with policymakers, etc. So what we see is that context really does matter. It is very important um, where we are looking at. Now, if context matters, what can we do with research quality? Because then research quality becomes something fluid. This is something in social sciences we know very well. It's called the latent concept. So we have different ideas what we see uh, as quality, but we need to define it. We need first to find what we are talking about in the specific context. And we can differentiate it between different criteria, and then we can find indicators that reflect some criteria. There might also be criteria for which no indicators are available, and this is very important because that is what metric systems cannot provide. So we started at the very beginning to find out what research quality means to humanity scholars and uh, because it is implicit knowledge. So we have used the method to explicate knowledge, implicit knowledge. And what we found was that there are four types of doing research. The one is very international, very coll collaborative. The second one is the so-called genius, is individual research um, but it's very high quality. Then we have the careerists. They are interdisciplinary and international not because they are, but because they have to in order to make careers. And then we have the very well-known ivory tower where people are just doing what they want. 
do not have any connection. And this is now interesting for if, uh, creating quality criteria. We can extract the first quality criteria from this research. For example, we see that the way of innovation differs between the international and the genius. Small step innovation is what interdisciplinary and, and uh, international project brings about, but really groundbreaking in innovation is the result of an individual that is focusing very strongly on his or her research. From that, we started finding uh, research quality criteria for the humanities. We also used um, a broad sample of people um, to tell us what they think about research evaluation. And we found out 19 criteria specified by 70 aspects. So a huge model. So quality is very, very complex. And we looked at how can we measure. We used the most used indicators and we looked how we can map them on the criteria. And what we found is that we have like five, six criteria we can measure of the 19. And we look at which criteria are the most important to the scholars we, in orange. We see that there is a strong gap between what we can measure and what is relevant to the scholar. It's exactly those criteria that are not relevant to the scholars for which we have the indicators. Now, this could be just humanity scholars, right? So why not translate it to different contexts? We did, did that um, with um, Misho Dokmanovic uh, in the context of social sciences. So what we had to do is, of course, changes to the wordings. So instead of saying stringent, comprehensible and convincing arguments for the humanities, we had to say stringent, reproducible and convincing arguments, arguments and evidence for the social sciences to make it more sensible. But basically, it's the same concept. We also had to add, of course, new aspects when we want to, uh, to add something, uh, when we want to adapt to social sciences. And here in the case, we said, uh, I am bold to raise issues which I believe are vital for the society, even though it might have negative consequences on my career. So to have a very strong relation to society. We also added or changed a criterion because fostering cultural memory is very humanities-like. So we, we separated impact on society in relation to society because the relation to society is more or less similar um, as to fostering cultural memory for the humanities. But basically, if we ask then the social science scholar which criteria are relevant, again, the result was basically the same. Very small differences in preference of some aspects of criteria were there, but basically the 19 criteria prevailed also in the social sciences. As context matter, Sven Hoog hans Dieter Daniel and I also wanted to adapt it to a different situation. Instead of just asking generally about what is research quality, we wanted to ask what is research quality of a grant proposal of an early career researcher. Of course, a lot of criteria do not play a role, so we had this selection of criteria. Um, timetable is clearly a project um, relevant criteria. The person CV diploma publications comes from the literature, what actually is usually evaluated in this context. And so we um, looked also here, what can we measure from those? And again, in italics, you can see independence can be measured, relevance, academic relevance can be measured, and everything to the person. But the rest cannot be measured by indicators. And if you look what is relevant to the scholars, Again, we have only academic relevance that is relevant and measurable. So still this gap. Another issue which is relevant, I think, also to sciences is practice-based research. And here I can use the uh, example of the arts. It's a study I um, did together with Camila uh, Lewandowska and Emmanuel Kuczynski. Um, what is practice-based research? It's research that comes from practice and uses practical output as knowledge production. You can also think about nursing. You can also think about engineering. It's basically a similar situation. So we have here, we have art, we have artistic research, and we have research. And sometimes identities just differ. And in performance-based evaluation system, this uh, is difficult to take into account to and different countries 
do that in very different ways. And that affects how art is included in the science system and how art is produced within higher education institutions. We see also that criteria used in those uh, performance-based systems are, find more or less consensus. And what is interesting here is that we have strong relevance for significance for artistic development, peer recognition, internationalization, because that is really what happens in art or is relevant to art. But we have much less important significance for research and rigor, because rigor was interpreted as scientific rigor, which has nothing to do with art. So we have to be careful if we define criteria for research when we want to evaluate practice-based research, because then we ask to transform artists into researchers rather than do artistic research. And this is what we found in the study. We found that we have different people, different artists who identify differently with the relation between art and research. Some of them see art and research as completely different realms. Some of them say they influence each other, but remain separate. And others say art is research. It's the same thing. It's pushing boundaries. And the criteria we use is we put emphasis of one or the other. But it might be different regarding what the artists actually do in their art. So what? If there is so complex, why do we talk about this situation. It's too complicated. It's very time consuming. It produces non-comparable results. It's completely subjective. Useless. Let's go back to music. We have said indicators are problematic. The Quara says stop using indicators more or less. But I didn't put the names of the groups. I just looked at which other related artist is shown for each of the six groups I mentioned before. I think I don't even need to say which one because you will see it from the images alone. So network is something that works extremely well. And we have the same thing with, for example, citations. It's very useful. So we can do things with indicators, but we need to know what. That is why it is relevant. If you look on the effects we can have on peer review and metrics, if we know what we are measuring, we can see that there are different notions of quality among different scholars. So suddenly it becomes logical why peers do not agree. If you have a peer reviewer from the orange line who really finds innovation very important, and one from the blue line which finds innovation is not important, it's rather rigor, they won't agree. Even though they might agree on all other criteria. So it is relevant to understand why people differ. We can get a grip on the issue of low interrate reliability. We can also learn to differentiate between criteria between different stakeholders, policymakers, researchers, practic practitioners. Similarly, also for indicators, as just uh, shown, we need to know what we measure, then we know what we measure, and we also, and this is very important, know what we cannot measure because then we can integrate it differently. We're not just letting it away. So I have a proposal for a responsible research evaluation framework that is rather simple in its outline, but complex in its application. So first of all, we need to define the context because it depends on the context what is relevant. Second, we need to identify the relevant stakeholders in this group. We need then to explicate the notions of quality of each stakeholder that is relevant in order to find out what we want to measure. And then we have to assign indicators, if they're available, to those notions of quality. We then need to rate the criteria similar, uh, uh, singularly so that we know for each criteria whether they agree or don't agree, which might be different in the final outcome for each reviewer, but similar in each rating. And finally, we need to interpret the results according to the context. 
So what can we do now when we know a little bit about what is the case in humanities, social sciences and the arts? I think there are some things we can extrapolate to all disciplines. First, numbers need to have context. They need to be meaningful. Data quality needs to be okay if you want to measure something. But also, evaluation is a political activity. It is defining values. It is not about not talking about politics. Politics. This is why it is subjective, because every evaluation is a political decision. And finally, there are incentives. Objective criteria, so-called objective criteria, can become invalid just because they're applied. People start to change their behaviors. We have also systematic bias uh, in the sciences. What you can see here is, for Brazil, only the yellow points are well represented in the web of sciences on topics. So if you want to study soil or other environmental issues, the web of science is not covering those topics for Brazilian research well. Of course, all the education is also not covered well. So it depends even for um, chemistry and physics and environmental sciences, um, which database you use um, because you might or might not include one or the other topic. So to conclude, this is my proposal. Taking a step back, think about what we want to measure and be aware of what we cannot measure with indicators so that we reflect it in our proposals and that we have a clear relation to what we talk about, that we can talk about the values we are doing, because evaluating is basically a political activity, an activity where we define what we want in the future. Thank you very much for the attention, and I hope we have a very vivid and interesting discussion afterwards. Yeah, thank you very much for this great presentation. <laughs> it's really a high level of complexity, the, this construct of research quality. Yeah, let's start with the discussion. Um, are there already some questions? No. Not in the chat, here in the audience? Okay, great. It should be on, yes. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. My name is Jessica Riguto, and I work in the Laboratory for Nutrition and Metabolic Epigenetics here at the ETH. Um, I'm involved at the moment in an international working group that is looking, well, we're designing a guideline for reporting of nutrition randomized control trials. And I have listened very, in, uh, with a lot of interest and a lot of attention to your presentation. And I'm slightly concerned now about our, what we think is a robust way of going about writing these guidelines. It's within the science and not within the social sciences and humanities, but we are seeking expert opinion on what we're trying to do. And now listening to you, I'm getting the impression that actually we should be going about this a, a, a different way. The way that we have chosen seems to be the acceptable way of making such guidelines. But in your opinion, should we be putting less emphasis on the opinions of experts and more emphasis elsewhere in order to get quality from these guidelines? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, a complicated one, because it, I like a little bit um, context. If it's about guidelines of a technical nature, on methodology in a specific disciplines. We have to think about who is involved. So my proposal will first be to have stakeholders defined. And maybe there are not many in this case, because it's basically experts in the discipline. Now we need to define what is an expert. Um, but that is another question. Um, 
but it's it's it's, it's rather a, a clearly defined population, so to speak. And uh, here we have a lot less problems than when we talk about evaluation of research in general in the discipline, right? Because we have a much more stakeholders. We have students, we have uh, the public, we have uh, the industry, in, in, in this case, I would say, etc. So this is much more complex than just having guidelines on a specific methodology, which is an important methodology, I, I think. So we have one stakeholders or two stakeholders, and then we, we would need to explicate what is relevant and why. So instead of just asking a few experts, what do you think, and then putting it to paper, try to find out what are the relevant aspects and agree on each aspect. Because some people might have different weighting of single aspects. So I would not say stop asking experts. I would rather say uh, it needs to be a reflected or reflexive speech so that everyone has a voice that needs to have a voice. There's no question in the chat, but perhaps I can ask one. One is very specific. Uh, at one of those uh, diagrams, you said that uh, there are SSH-specific uh, evaluation criteria. So in what are SSH-specific, or in your study, what, where, what was defined as SSH-specific evaluation criteria? I think it was on one of the first ones. Oh. And uh, this, the second question is more general. <laughs> um, uh, the second question is more general. And um, you said evaluation is political. And uh, when you are talking about the SSH, we are also talking about history. Um, when became eva also evaluation when, when became evaluation and especially bibliometric evaluation that important for kind of research quality in the long history of universities okay two different questions uh, the first one is easier to respond to me because that's my <laughs> uh, my subject of research. So we have a <clears throat> a large um, rainbow of different uh, quality criteria here. Um, these are all defined by seventy aspects, and those aspects are more clearly defining units that can be measurable so to speak. So for example, for scholarly exchange, we have disciplinary exchange, how you communicate with your discipline, interdisciplinary exchange, whether you reach out, and international exchange, for example. Um, now those aspects, of course, can be discipline specific. So for the social sciences, um, we do not have the criteria fostering cultural memory because that is a formulation that is very humanities-like. This is what humanities are about. It's about cultural heritage, etc. Social sciences are also, in a way, about cultural heritage, but it's more oriented towards society. So we picked a part relation to and impact on society. So we said relation to society is what we would call fostering cultural memory. It's a reformulation. Um, in the sense of what is the role between the, the goal of the study and, and the study. And then, of course, you have all these different uh, things like criticism, where it is reflection criticism that can be very differently. The humanities is very central, and it's a lot of self-criticism. It's, it's like in literature studies, how do I relate to, to the author? How important is that for me? I have a, a relationship to it, and my research is not neutral. 
However, in, in uh, social sciences, this, this would be something like um, I constantly point towards misspecifications in society, right? conspiracy theories. I will talk about conspiracy theories. I have to be critical about some notions in society that are uh, not very uh, elaborated. So you find different uh, definitions of those criteria. And I guess if you would go to sciences, um, I was told by chemists that most of those criteria are meaningful. But when we talk about what it is, it's going to be very different from the humanities. Second question, when became bibliometrics or when indicators became important for research evaluation? I did not study that in detail, so I cannot really answer. Um, but when it comes to the humanities and social sciences, um, there was a long time where it was very controversial discussed and it was uh, not adopted. So it was, it was seen as not relevant for humanities and social science already because the data was not um, covering um, their subjects. They were writing in German and Web of Science was English, for example. Um, but in the last years, many national uh, evaluation procedures started to implement um, metric systems. And so First, social scientists and the humanities scholars had to cope with it. And there, um, some um, elaborated critique took part. In Germany, for example, the historians boycotted the German Wissenschaft uh, rating in 2009. So that was really a prominent example. Yeah, and the arts too, because you first have to invent artistic research and then... <laughs> Indeed, that is, an, that is a very interesting thing because art has never been here in Switzerland, has never been seen as an activity of universities. It, it has been art schools. Um, that was different in the UK, where they were very early integrated into the higher education system. And because of that, the research access, assessment exercise had to be defined because the universities were not happy that suddenly such strange institutions were also called universities. So they had to find a way to distinguish between them and the others. So there was the evaluation exercise that was implemented to kind of a, to counterbalance that. And in Switzerland, this only take part recently and um, in different countries at different stages. So in the last 30 years, I would say this integration um, took slowly part. There are more questions in the chat, if there are no in the room. Um, first question, um, how did you consider the type of funding instruments and their typicalities, uh, career funding, project funding, seed funding, in analyzing the evaluation types in different countries? Not sure whether I understand the question correctly. Um, it was a long process, so to speak, in, in this network, in this European network, that was a cost action. And we were just different scholars from the humanities, social sciences, and, and higher, research, higher education research meeting together and trying to take a grip on how research is evaluated across countries. And um, it, it took us two years until we understood what we mean by evaluating. And the other two years, we tried to f f kind of get a grip on it. And finally, we found out, well, it's, it's even more complicated than we thought because there are so many different levels scholars are evaluated. For example, in Bulgaria, you have two national funding inst uh, institutional funding systems and ev evaluations, one of the government and one of the opposition. It gets very complicated because they don't only have one, but they have two. Of, of many of the funding systems. So either you work with the government or you work with the opposition <laughs> and you get a good or a bad evaluation in one or the other. So um, we considered it on the go. So the first graph I showed 
was mainly about national in evaluation systems, like um, the main evaluation system in a country plus a project funding. That was um, ooh, this graph. So it's mainly about the dominant evaluation system, and when, it, like in Switzerland, where nothing's no such thing exists, we thought about institutional evaluation. So uh, me, I would be evaluated at the University of Zurich and at FORCE. That was the basis of, of that research. And we've just found out that this is not precise enough because there are so many levels. We're not even talking about the international system because scholars, they move around different systems. So you move between uh, countries. So you have different... If, if you want to work uh, in the UK, you, you already might need to anticipate how you will be evaluated there in case you want to go there. Because the evaluation system in the UK differs profoundly from the evaluation system in Switzerland. This is something that is not really considered in a lot of uh, studies in higher education. It is known that we have different national evaluation procedures, so these two columns are usually uh, distinguished. But that the fact that there are completely different logics in each country, um, I think, is not discussed enough. I don't know whether I answered the question. <laughs> We have a second one that goes in the same direction a little bit. It is a quite uh, uh, concrete question. Uh, was career level of grant application, uh, uh, applicants associated with different research quality indicators? So, It's a, a very important point. I will try to um, explain. Uh, sorry, the, the next question uh, is if you mainly looked at career evaluation and not project evaluation at this point. A project evaluation here. Uh, at this point, it was um, for a specific grant uh, for early career researchers that exist um, in Switzerland or in, at the University of Zurich, but we asked um, all humanities scholars across Switzerland how they would uh, evaluate this because they're potential experts in those evaluation. They would be invited to evaluate some proposals. Now, um, what is interesting here, for example, um, is we have originality that we took more or less from, from the general ev evaluation criteria. And what we see is identify gaps is very important for um, senior researchers in their institutional evaluation of a, of a chair. This would be very important because identifying gaps is what you do and also Finding a new paradigm in SSH, that would be like the crown of what you could do. If you're introducing a new paradigm in the humanities, then you have done it, right? This is the most important thing. But if it comes to grants for early career research, obviously new approaches, new research topic, new paradigm are not in there. Why? If they are so important for a humanities scholar? It's a very, very simple answer to that. Because we're talking about early career people, how, how could they possibly invent a new paradigm? It's, if they do, of, of course, nobody will say, no, that project is not what we do, or you cannot do it, or whatever. But this is nothing you can expect from an early career researcher. Simply, it's, it's not something you expect from an early career researcher. Therefore, it is not a relevant criteria to evaluate it. I don't know whether this really answered the question. Okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, many thanks uh, uh, for this very interesting talk. <laughs> My name is Rüdiger Mutz. I come from the from Chess Center of Higher Education and Science Studies, and I'm more or less concerned with quantitative science studies. And I'm a little bit. Uh, we are uh, former colleagues, therefore <laughs> it's a little bit uh, home. 
come home, coming home. Yes, I have a question, two questions. The first is that this kind of criteria are very value loaded. I think you have values. If you make values transparent, it could be that the panel discuss about values which cannot discuss because uh, values are different, difficult to, to make consents about. And I, therefore, I think it might be a problem uh, to implement such frameworks because you provoke certain conflicts or perhaps you inspire such ideas. That's the first question, how to deal with such value-loaded aspects. The second is, have you any implementations of this framework. I think it would be interesting if you have a funding organization or something else where you can implement it. it. Because we have now a lot of uh, research in quantitative science studies about funding organization, about uh, uh, such uh, yeah, editorial or board or something else. But there is less cooperation uh, with such organization, for example, I participate mainly in such project with the Austrian Science Fund or with, uh, with the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and so on with concrete uh, projects and I was uh, participated mainly and we also look how to implement certain things or, or to make uh, recommendations. And therefore, for me, the, the question is, is there also such an implementation of these things? Thank you very much for the two questions. Indeed, uh, Rüdiger was uh, very much involved in, in uh, earlier studies, especially methodologically. Um, I think the, um, the questions you ask are, are, are highly important as, um, about the value-laden uh, criteria, discussing values. Um, if you talk about values, you can discuss about them or you can leave it untreated. But you cannot make them disappear. So evaluation is nothing but talking about values. It's the, the very action of evaluation is values, is discussing values. If you try to be objective, it won't work because there is no such thing as an objective evaluation. Um, societal impact is a very, very good case because we can talk about evaluating the societal impact of archaeology. We can say it's too, too much too expensive to have like this site and this site and this site uh, documented and, and everything. So it's, 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 it's taking time, etc. So we should focus rather on, on other things. Um, there's just one project more. And a few years later, such a site is destroyed. That changes completely societal impact of the documentation. And that happened um, in Palmyra, for example. There was a project by the uh, Norwegian fund, and it struggled to get funding. But while they were there, the ES were coming in. They were almost done, and the project leaders was beheaded and everything, and this was then by the Innovation Fund spearheaded as a very societally impactful project because we have documented what now is destroyed. So a very small thing, a very small happening can change the notion of what is relevant considerably. And this is why you cannot take that out from evaluation. So values is the basis of evaluation and um, there is a very nice book by Dahler Larsen called The Evaluation Society, where he really describes what happens if one leaves out the discussion about values. And this is exactly what happened in the last 30 years. We stopped talking about values, while before it was basically about values. Second question. Can you help me? <laughs> Implementation, yeah. Um, this is a difficult topic because an implementation is 
you need someone who is ready to do it. Um, what we have done is several small things. So we were invited by the University of Vienna um, for uh, some institutions where they had an evaluation to be done and the institute wanted to um, have a little bit more control on their evaluation. And we did a workshop with them so that they could explicate their own criteria and bring that in in their evaluation. So it's not the evaluation process that was uh, designed according to our research. It was rather the response to a specific evaluation procedure where it empowered the scholars to discuss criteria with the policymakers because there is a clash between the discourse of policymakers and the discourse on the scholars and the wordings and how you talk about it. And what is important is to bring that communication on the same level. And here it can be very useful. Um, another application is um, a journal. So uh, in some journals we have clear guidelines on criteria, but basically nobody really looks at it if there is peer review. So some journals really focus on we have criteria, please look at the criteria. If the reviewers are not feeding back on the criteria, um, they are told to, to do that or they are ignored. So this is another um, place where uh, this kind of idea has been implemented in some way or the other. So there, are, uh, there is interest. Um, also, the European uh, Commission is very interested in how to implement such things, but there is a very, very slow way of, of improving and of discussing, and it takes years and years and years. So I'm not very positive that uh, this will be implemented in the next framework program. Are there a last question? Is there a last question in the audience or in the chat? because uh, the hour of the colloquium is already... All right. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much for uh, this great presentation and the discussion. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, say goodbye to uh, the online participants, and I hope to see you all at the opera um, here in the foyer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.